Okay, Fresno, what's the goal? The goal is Amen. Well, this is the first generation that uh, statistically is a, a generation where people did not go to church. Here's what I mean by that. Here's what I mean by that. Many people, and maybe this doesn't necessarily apply to Fresno as much, but you go to most of your metropolitan cities and you will find that this generation is a generation that really didn't go to church. Why? Because their parents didn't go to church. Which means that their grandparents, maybe they did go to church, but they did not bring their kids with them. Or when it, like, like my generation, uh, you know, my dad stopped going at, when I was around 16. My mom's like, we're going to go to church. And I said, well, if dad doesn't go, I don't have to go. And uh, she couldn't argue with that. And so I didn't go. You know what I mean? But what that does is it creates a number of generations that just don't understand the Bible. They don't know the stories, right? They, they, they might have heard of maybe some of the stories of David and Goliath. I was uh, uh, overhearing a conversation. Somebody was talking about a, like a big whale that swallowed some guy. You know what I mean? Like, like we know kind of bits and pieces and, and things like that. But really understanding some of the core stories and the narrative of Scripture People just don't understand. Uh, many people didn't grow up uh, praying before they ate a meal or, or having their mother or father pray for them before they went to bed. Uh, many people did not have a mom or a grandma that sang, Jesus loves me, this I know to them. Uh, my grandma, my grandma Edna, she's uh, passed on a long time ago, but she used to make tapes. I know some of y'all kids don't understand what I'm talking about there, but at least recordings, little audio cassette tapes. Uh, and she would, she would read Bible stories. She would pray for us. She would, she would sing songs. And so that was, that, I would get that probably once a month. I'd get this tape uh, from my grandma and we would play it at night and all this kind of stuff. But as a preacher, this makes things a little difficult because I have to take a little bit of extra time to explain some of these stories that for many people uh, who grew up in church or grew up around the faith already know. Now, I don't mind that. In fact, I'd rather, I'd rather like that because it allows to have a little bit more context to the passages. But the challenge is that I cannot assume that somebody knows what I'm talking about. I cannot assume that somebody even has a, a great knowledge of Jesus. You know, we, we might know about the Bible. We might know that what Jesus did. Yeah, yeah, he died on the cross, this guy. We might know these things. But in the grand scheme of things, do we really know? Do we really understand? And this is why we're walking through some of the basics of Christianity in the series Christianity 101. What's awesome is that this is not a new situation. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, Peter is writing a letter to the churches and he says, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. What is he saying? He's saying, hey, I got to tell you about this again. I've got to go back to the basics and reshare these things with you. And you know what? I don't mind. I think it's a right thing for me to do. So today, I'm going to teach you how to have a quiet time. Oh. I'm going to teach you how to have a quiet time. And that's the title of our lesson this morning, how to have an awesome quiet time. So with that in mind, we've got to start at the beginning. What do I mean when I use the phrase quiet time? Go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. you got a lot of flipping going on, so you're going to have to be quick. What is a quiet time? What is a quiet time? Mark chapter 1. Look here in verse 35. The Bible says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, 
Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. In other words, before Jesus got started with his day, he went off to a quiet, secluded place to have alone time with God. And if you read through the Gospels, you will see that he did this on a regular basis. This wasn't just a one-time shot here in Mark chapter 1. Matthew 14, verse 13, it says, When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. Mark chapter 6, verse 45 through 46, write these down. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Mark 14, verse 32 through 34. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I go and pray. Luke 4, 42. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. Luke 6, 4, uh, 6 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Hold on, I'm not done. Luke 9, 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, and then finally, John 6, 15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come by, come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus would get up before the sun came up and would go to places by himself with God. In fact, Luke 5, 16 says, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. This was his quiet time with God. And it was a constant and consistent practice for him. So what is the definition of a quiet time? When I say a quiet time, what do I mean? I mean a private one-on-one time with God that you do first thing in the morning. It's a time of prayer, reading your Bible, meditating on what you read, and making decisions about how you will be living your life differently based on what you read and heard from God. Okay, so now we know what it is Let's talk about why it's important. Why are quiet times important? Let's begin with the obvious. If quiet times were important to Jesus, then it should be important to us. Amen? Amen. All right, we're done. Let's go. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. It was so important to Jesus. In, In fact, no matter how busy he was, no matter how overwhelmed he was, no matter what was happening in his life, he spent time with God. I would argue that there is nobody busier than Jesus. There has never been anybody busier than Jesus. You know, often when I'm studying the Bible with somebody, we'll do a study with them called Seeking God and help them understand, hey, God wants you to seek Him with all your heart, and He's actually seeking after you too. And this is an awesome relationship of of reciprocity and back and forth, and it's great. We get together again, hey man, how, how are your quiet times going? Oh, man, I just, you know, just, I'm just so busy, you know? I mean, like, I got school, you know? I, I got a job. Oh, great, good for you, you know? The reality is, I understand. We are busy. We got a lot going on, right? I'm not looking down on anybody. I'm busy too, right? But if you're too busy to have a quiet time with God, then you are that, too busy. No one was busier than Jesus. Let me give you two examples. Go to Matthew 14. Matthew 14. Let me give you two examples of Jesus keeping his quiet time with God, even in the midst of busy schedule and his emotional and physical exhaustion. Matthew 14. We're going to look at the entire chapter. It's a wonderful case study here. Matthew 14, starting here in verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. So this is a little flashback. We're going to get a little bit of a flashback here. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. So what did Herod do? Herod uh, basically stole his brother's wife and took him as his own wife. John the Baptist, being a righteous man, is like, yo, you can't do that. And uh, he didn't like it very much. Herodias didn't like it either. We'll get to that in a minute. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. 
On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed because of his oaths and his dinner guests. He ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Now, what does this have any significance to having a quiet time? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. But we find here that John the Baptist had just been brutally murdered, beheaded by Herod the king. Now, just so that you understand the context, John the Baptist wasn't just some dude. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, six months older. These two would have grown up together. Not only was he the forerunner and the, 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 the prophet that was to come that kind of prepared the way for Jesus' ministry, but they were homies. They were close. And so Jesus finds out that John the Baptist, his cousin, had just been brutally murdered. And here's what we find if we keep going to verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Most scholars say this is about eight or nine in the morning when this happens. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the village and buy themselves some food. So it's been a full day of ministry for Jesus, and now it's getting late. Again, probably about five or six in the evening at this time. Jesus replied, They don't need to go anywhere. You give them something to eat. Now, that's a tall order. Like, what? Hold up. Uh, uh, we, we, we want to send them away because uh, we don't have anything to feed them with. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Back then, they only counted the men. Uh, But if you add women and children, the math here is around 10 to 12 to 15,000 people here. That's insane. Verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Now, some of you might be sitting here saying, okay, Eric, no problem. Quiet time, but Jesus is not having a quiet time in the morning. He's having a quiet time at night. Yes, you're right. Here he is spending alone time with God at night. But this illustrates the importance of Jesus getting alone time with God. He is wiped out. He's wiped out physically. He's wiped out emotionally. He's wiped out spiritually again. He finds out that his best friend and cousin was brutally murdered. He tries to get away to grieve, but what happens? Everybody comes to him, and now he's got to meet needs. Full day of meeting needs, and after that, he still gets time to spend alone with God. What does he do? He goes up to a mountainside to pray. He doesn't go and turn on Netflix and binge watch. He doesn't pop up on YouTube Reels and just scrolls to his heart content until he's like, oh my gosh, it's been four hours. I better go to bed. No comfort food to make him feel better. He goes and he spends time with God. He tells the guys, hey, go ahead so he could get time alone. Now let's make the assumption that you're right. Let's make the assumption that you're right that he did not have a quiet time in the morning but this was his quiet time. The reason for him not having a quiet time in the morning was because he wasn't able to. And the reason why he wasn't able to is because people found him. If you're a parent, you understand this. You're sitting there chilling in the office. You're sitting there chilling in your room. You're sitting there chilling somewhere and the kids come. 
and they, you go, hey, mom, I need you to make me breakfast. Dad, I need you to blah, blah, blah. Hey, where's my this? Where's my that? Blah, blah, blah. You can't. So now what do you got to do? You got to pause. You got to go meet the need. But what's your reason? I guarantee you that our reason is I slept in. Or I needed to study. Or any number of, I guarantee you that your reason was not noble like Jesus. Think about the last time you didn't have a quiet time. I guarantee you it wasn't because you had to go meet a whole bunch of needs and heal a bunch of people and, you know, meet needs. So I think we can all agree that that excuse doesn't hold. There will be times, we're not legalistic about this, we will, there will be times where you get sidetracked and you blow it, but here's Jesus, emotionally spent. Not just emotionally spent from a standpoint of like the grieving process of his, of his cousin being killed and finding that out, but just meeting needs all day. And he still goes and gets time with God. I want to show you this from another example. That no matter what Jesus was going through, he was going to get alone time with God. Go to Matthew 26. I appreciate Emma and her insights into this passage and sharing what this passage meant to her, but I think it offers us an opportunity to look at it again as well. Matthew 26, look here in verse 36. It says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Contrary to popular belief, Jesus was not excited to go to the cross. He didn't skip to the cross. He wasn't singing songs going to the cross. He wanted another way. But then he got himself surrendered to God's way. He returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Then he came back. He again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Jesus knows that his time on earth is about to be done. He's feeling a lot, a lot in his heart, a lot in his mind, and he goes and gets time alone with God. Now, if Jesus, if if I were Jesus, I would have stayed in the room and I would have just griped and moaned about what was about to take place. I would have probably talked smack about Judas. I would have probably talked smack about the disciples that were going to, like, try to betray me. You know what I'm saying? But getting alone time with God, honestly, would not be my first instinct going into a situation like that. But here he is, focusing on going to the only one that could do anything about his situation. Yes, he wanted his guys to be there. He wanted his guys to, to pray with him. Going for a prayer walk or having a group quiet time is an important part of discipleship, but the example of Jesus is that he still wanted to withdraw away from the group and get some time alone with God. Now, if Jesus felt it was important enough for him to get some alone time with God, no matter what was going on around him, then it must be something that every disciple must do. That every follower of Jesus must do. No ifs, ands, or buts, no excuses. Because Jesus is the standard of what we're living up to. Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11.1, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So all the great men of the Bible, all the great women of the Bible, followed the example of Jesus. And you and I should do the very same thing. If Jesus had a quiet time, then you and I need to do the same. Amen? Amen. But let's, let's dive a little bit deeper. I want to give you three reasons why you need to have a quiet time. Three reasons. Number one, well, this is technically four reasons. The first reason is Jesus is our great example. We should do what he has done. But secondly, it is the only way for you and I to develop an intimate relationship with God. Go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2.
Look here in verse 4. It is the only way for you and I to develop an intimate relationship with God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4 says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. The word know here is gnosko in the Greek, which means to know intimately. You're like, me and God, we're like this. We're just, he's my homie. We're close. We're together. But if you do not obey what he says, the Bible says you're a liar. You don't actually know God. Right? Like, I know, I know LeBron James. (laughs) But I don't know LeBron James. You know what I'm saying? We are commanded to pray, the Bible says. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In fact, we're commanded to pray continually. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. Literally, the verse just simply says, pray continually. That's it. We're commanded to seek God and draw near to him. 1 Chronicles 16, verse 11 says, look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Jeremiah 29, 12 and 13. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. The promise is that if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. James 4, verse 8. Come near to God and he will come near to you. We are commanded to study his word and meditate on it day and night. Psalm 1, verse 2. But those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. And that is what a quiet time is all about. It's about praying. It's about seeking his face. It's about reading his word, meditating on it all day long. So if we're not doing that, and we say we know God intimately, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. Let me tell you something. Your lie will find you out. You cannot know God if you do not have a daily quiet time with him. And if you say that you know God and do not spend time with him, quality time with him on a daily basis, the Bible says you are a liar and you'll be found out. Let me tell you how this is going to happen. It's going to happen in two ways. Number one is on your deathbed, there will come a time when all of us, there are two constants in this life, death and taxes. That's it. (laughs) Death and taxes. Can't do anything about taxes, but we can talk about death for here for a minute, okay? When you are on your deathbed, and you have an intimate relationship with God, if you actually know Him, you will have nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. Just because you come to church, just because you might know the Bible studies, just because you might own a Bible and read it, does not, it is not a guarantee that you will be ready when God comes to call you. And it does not guarantee that Jesus will be there to bring you home to God. You will not have known God, and therefore you will not have confidence that He knows you. Write this down, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. The scariest, actually go turn there. Go turn there. Matthew 7. I want you to see this. This is the scariest passage in the Bible, period scares me to death and is a great reminder of why we need to continually have an intimate relationship with God. Matthew 7 verse 21 says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name I drive out demons, in your name perform many miracles. And what's Jesus' response? I will tell them plainly. I will make it clear as crystal. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Again, the word knew or know in this is the same word that we just read in 1 John 2 verse 4. You can do a lot of crazy things. You can do a lot of awesome things for God. But if you do not have a relationship with him, an intimate knowing, an intimate relationship, Jesus calls you an evildoer. 
Let that sink in. But let's look at this from another angle. Not only will the lie be evident on our deathbeds, but it will also be evident in our daily lives. John 14, verse 6 says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Later on in John 14, in fact, I'd I'd recommend you read the entire chapter of John 14. It really illustrates and highlights this point in a big way. John 14, verse 12 says, Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands. If you know me, if you have an intimate relationship with me, you will do what I call you to do. If your life is not lined up with the words of Jesus, if your life is not lined up with the scriptures, then you are equally showing that you are a liar if you say that you know God, but you do not actually obey. 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, nobody can save themselves, so it's not an issue of self-salvation. It's an issue of when you're lined up with the Scriptures, you'll be doing what God's called you to do. You'll be actually walking in an intimate relationship with Jesus and obeying His Word, and that is what will get you to heaven. If your life and doctrine are not lined up, then you are equally showing, again, that you are a liar. If either of these truths are true for you, my friends and family, then I challenge you to get open with the person who invited you here or get open with Ariel or I after the service and let's get you on track or get you back on track. Amen? A daily quiet time is the only way to develop an intimate relationship with God. Next, you have a quiet time to increase your knowledge of Him and his word. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's go, bro. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The more you know, the more you will grow as his disciple. Come on. Just remember that, right? It rhymes for a reason, right? The more you know, the more you will grow as a disciple of Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. That's a pretty hardcore indictment of where somebody's at spiritually. I love Paul's analogy. A baby cannot handle anything but milk for the first four to six months. But when they reach about that four to six month mark, you need to start mixing in puree, right? Some of the, I can still taste it when I think about it. Some of the best applesauce is baby applesauce, man. Not like the kind that, you know, like you got the, some of these like hippie, you know, parents that like make it on their own. You know what I mean? I'm talking about the store-bought stuff. You know what I'm saying? Gerber? Gerber, baby. There it is. It's the best. It's the best. But for parents in the room, right, we understand this. How much of that awesome tasting baby applesauce actually gets into the mouth of the kid like half of it maybe have you ever wondered why it's kind of interesting i never thought about this before but as i was preparing for this lesson kind of thinking about this idea of milk and solid food and all this kind of stuff i I did some digging into this and it you ever like if again if you've got younger siblings you might know this or you got babies that you're around what they do is you, their, their, their automatic reaction to something coming into their mouth is to suck, which is why you bottle and milk and all that kind of stuff, right? So when you start to give them like puree food, what are they, what are they trying to do? Suck it. And so they're trying to like suck it in, but as they do so, the tongue goes to the roof of their mouth. And for us as adults, we have teeth. And so the teeth kind of stop the tongue from going out. But with babies, they don't have teeth. So what do they do? (laughs) Right? And so what happens? The the stuff comes out. And then you like grab, you know, the spoon and kind of wipe their mouth with it and stick it back in. Try it again. You know what I mean? (laughs) This happens over and over and over again. So milk, not a problem. 
puree, we start to have some issues. Until they begin to develop the ability to swallow, not just suck. Okay? Maybe this is the reason why some of our lives are a bit of a mess. Is because we only actually are able to take in half of what God's trying to give us. You are still an infant and are spitting out the food that God is trying to feed you through his word and the discipling that you receive. Something we'll consider a little later on in this lesson. Next, at about 10 to 11 months, you begin to develop the ability to swallow and you can begin to have some soft food. Again, they're not just sucking, but now they can chew and swallow a little bit. But they haven't really mastered the ability to chew. So if you give them solid food, they're going to choke on it. So don't do that, amen? But think about it. If your child was two to three years old and they were still on milk, they were still, you know, having a bottle, you'd be like, that's not right. There's something wrong with this picture. You should be able to handle the meat of the word. But Paul says you can't handle it. You're still a baby Christian. You're not growing. Hebrews 5, verse 11. Go ahead and turn there. Hebrews 5, verse 11. And we'll read to chapter 6, verse 1. It says, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. The NIV of the 1984 version of the NIV says, You are slow to learn. In fact, though, by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. Let's move on from you gotta, you're a sinner and you need to repent. Let's move on from you got to have faith in God. You got to have a relationship with God, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews says. You ever noticed when people leave God or they leave the church and, and then they, they go out back into the world and then they, they come back and they get restored and everything's awesome for a little bit, then they just go right back out to the world. And it's just like this pendulum swing. Or... You've got people that come into the church and they, they repent, but they don't really fully repent. And, and so they keep struggling with the same issues over and over and over again, D time after D time. They, they just can't seem to break through. They just can't seem to change. Same sin cycle. What's the real issue? Is it the church? No, but people will make it about the church. Is the Bible controlling and restrictive and, and those people in my life, they just make it? No. Is it a lack of accountability? No, it's that they do not grow spiritually. They're not growing up. Because if you're not learning, you're not growing. You have what psychologists call arrested development, which simply means that you stop maturing as a disciple. You stop growing as a Christian. And that would not be happening if you were having daily quiet times with God every morning. Your knowledge of God and your relationship with him would be growing the way that it's supposed to be if you were spending time with him. Next, and probably more importantly in this process of growing, is the process of a quiet time requires you to evaluate yourself on a daily basis. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Requires you to evaluate yourself on a daily basis. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. We've read this before many, many times. I want to read it in the New Living Translation just to give us a little bit of a different perspective. It says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Did you catch those five things? Number one is it teaches us what is true. Number two, it makes us realize what's wrong in our lives. That's that self-evaluation. Number three is it corrects us when we are wrong. Number four is it teaches us what we should be doing to succeed in life. And number five, it prepares and equips us to be able to do what will make us successful in this life. In other words, every day when I read God's word and meditate on it, it is revealing where I'm blowing it in my life and where I'm doing good. Hey, I got this on point. I got to keep walking in that direction. Okay, man, this is, I got to bring this back into alignment. 
So you can see the whole process of reading the Bible and meditating on it, then praying about it and obeying it. This causes me personally to evaluate whether or not I am living out God's word in my life. And if I'm not, it should convict me to repent and change. Go to James chapter 1. Let's look at this. We're used to reading this in the New International Version. Most of us, I want to, again, read it in the New Living Translation just to give us a different perspective. James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, But don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. What's another word for fooling yourself? You're lying to yourself. For if you listen to the Word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. So instead of having a yearly evaluation every January, or as I like to do it every December, and then setting resolutions and goals that you might or might not go after, usually you won't go after because you'll forget them, I'm doing a personal evaluation of my life every morning in my quiet time. That alone is with every moment spent with God. And in truth, honestly, it's the only reason why I'm standing here in front of you. It's because every morning I wake up, look in the Word, okay, God, where am I at? Where do I need to change? Where do I need to grow? What am I doing good? Where am I off? I got to align myself. I'm heading in that direction. The only reason I'm not stuck in my life is because I get to take time daily and evaluate where I'm at and where God wants me to be and ask him to give me a way to get there. If you're stuck in life, I can tell you exactly why you're stuck. It's because you do not have a daily quiet time. Period. Period. Maybe I should have started with this. Yes, last week. (laughs) Let's start with the 101, 101, 101. Not even 101. This is like Christianity 1. Maybe Christianity 0.5. Or if you do have a quiet time, maybe you're one of those people that that do have a quiet time. You open up the app. You've got the scripture of the day. you got some guy that's kind of sharing a little bit of knowledge in the Bible app. you got this prayer that you can pray with them. Boom. Ten minutes, five minutes, you're done. Walk away. Everything's great. Maybe it's an issue of quality time. You're just checking the box. You're just going through the motions. You're not investing in the relationship. Truly talking and listening to God. You know what's crazy is that studies show that people who read and study their Bibles and have time of personal reflection in their lives are more successful than those that don't. This is not even a Christian study. One comment on a study done by the Templeton Foundation on prayer said this, In fact, we have shown that intercessory prayer for the well-being of a loved one not only improves relationship outcomes, but also the praying person's mitochondrial function. Oxygen used and blood receipt by the heart occurred without it having to work as hard compared to persons in meditation or no prayer conditions. Physiologically, your body actually reacts in prayer when you're praying to God, not just for other people, but for yourself. You actually have more mitochondrial function. Your brain and heart actually work better than they do if you don't. Another study conducted by the Center for Biblical Engagement says this, The power of four is evident when we consider that for some of these behaviors, getting drunk, sex outside of marriage, examined There is no statistical difference between Christians, quote unquote, who read or listen to the Bible two to three days a week and those who do not engage scripture at all or only once a week. Let me me engage this with you. What is this saying? If you read your Bible and if you listen to the word of God or you read the word of God two to three times a week, there is no difference between somebody who does that in their life and somebody who does not have a quiet time. Isn't that funny? Statistically, there is zero difference. Now, does this mean if you only have three quiet times a week, like you just should forget it and not do it? No. 
one, two, three is better than none, but at the same time, you've got to understand that there's a consistency to it. Check this out. For those behaviors where there is an effect for engaging scripture two or three days a week, the effect is much smaller than for four or more days a week. What does that mean? That means people sin less the more they spend time with God. If you have four out of seven quiet times, you will actually engage in sin less. And that's a worldly study. That's a study for people who are Christians, not even real disciples. How much more for us? Now you can clearly see that daily quiet times matter more than sporadic couple of quiet times a week. And maybe you can see how ineffective your lives are and why for those of you who only seek a couple quiet times a week, that you are struggling, that you're having a hard time, that you're not really able to break through. Every morning, the people that have daily quiet times are looking at their lives putting it back on track with God. This was David's practice. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Every morning, we are having a quiet time with God. We say, God, show me where I'm blowing it. Show me what needs to change. God, help me get back on track. So they make daily changes and are focused on the things that really matter in life instead of getting sidetracked. You know, maybe you're not aware that this was actually happening during your quiet time, but this is what's actually happening. And now you know. The process of a daily quiet time itself requires you to do a self-evaluation and choose to get back on track or to choose not to. And there are consequences for that. If you really want to know where you need to grow, and what you need to do in order to do so, the daily quiet time will get you there. Every day of your life should be getting better and better and better, going from strength to strength to strength, as the scripture says. And God, in that daily quiet time, will lead you and guide you to areas of study. He will then, because you're aware and open to it, guide you to men and women in your life who will teach you, give you godly counsel that you will listen to because your heart and mind are attentive to the direction that the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you. This is why in the Hebrews 5 scripture, he says you're slow to learn. You're dull, you're babies, you're infants. You're not mature, you're not growing. Why? Because you're not growing, you can't have breakthrough. Because you're not growing and you're still on milk, not solid food, you're not able to recognize when you're being taught and, and being able to grow from what you're being taught. And again, we wonder why our lives are the way that they are. The self-reflection process of a daily quiet time will help you grow and see success in your life. So what does this look like? Let me give you a simple example of how to have a quiet time. It all starts with a simple step again and I want to read this from the New Living Translation. Go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts 17 verse 10. It says, That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they received the message, or they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. As a result, many of them believed, as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. Eagerly examine every day. Many of us know this as the 3E challenge or the Berean challenge, one way or the other, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. Have a daily quiet time. And this is what that looks like. Number one. Read through the book of John. You might be like, well, I already read through the book of John. Okay, cool. Pick Mar Mark, pick Matthew, pick Luke, no problem. If you haven't read through all the Gospels yet, start there. Start there. Now, why the book of John? Why do we start with the book of John? Well, let me read you John 20, verse 30 and 31. Write that down. John 20, verse 30 and 31. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So why start with the book of John? Because if you want to believe in Jesus, if you want to have eternal life, that's the reason why John wrote the book. 
So start there. Simple as that. So number one, read through the book of John. One chapter a day. There's about 21 chapters. You can get it done in a month. No problem. Scientifically, if you do something for 22 days, you will have created a habit. 22 days. 21 chapters a day. 21 days. And then you do just one more. 22 days, you've created a habit of a daily morning quiet time. So one chapter a day. Next, you answer four questions in an analog notebook. Let me tell you what the word analog means for those of you that might not. Not on a device. Do not type out the answers to these questions. Write them out in a journal. Write them out in a notebook. Number one question. What do you observe? What do you get out of it? What stands out to you? What's going on that hits you? Number two, what about Jesus' character do you want to imitate? Now, as you move on to some of the other books of the Bible, this kind of shifts a little bit, and you might want to say, hey, what about the man of God do I want to imitate? What godly qualities in what's happening in this scenario do I want to imitate? But when we're talking about Jesus, we ask, what about Jesus' character do we want to imitate? Why? Because we're trying to be disciples of Jesus. We're trying to be Christians, little Christ, imitating Jesus. Number three, what do you need to start doing or stop doing in order to put that into practice? What does that mean? You actually have to change. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, calling her out on her sin. He's doing it in a very gentle, loving, and kind way. Man, when I call people out on their sin, I'm kind of a jerk. I'm kind of mean. I just lay it out. That ain't right. Okay, cool. I need to speak the truth in love. That doesn't mean that I'm loving by speaking the truth no matter how I want to speak it. No, I actually need to be loving to this person in the way that I speak the truth. Okay? Then I need to probably pause and go, okay, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, mom, grandma, Uncle Bill, whatever, they said this to me. I need to have that tough conversation. How do I go about having this tough conversation? God, help me have this tough conversation in a way that's loving. And then finally, and then go doing it, right? Number, <laughs> number three, doing it. And then finally, number four is what questions do you have? The NIV itself is written at eighth grade reading level. So it's not that it's hard to understand, but we're meant to be in community with one another and so therefore, there are going to be things where you're just like, man, I just don't understand what's going on here. That doesn't make you dumb. That makes you just like everybody else who have been programmed from birth to go, this is unacceptable to you. This is inaccessible to you. Wow. Why? Because you got some guy in a pulpit up front that is expounding on the scriptures and it's obviously his job to know. It's my job just to shut up and listen. No. Is that what the Bereans were doing? No, they eagerly accept. And they didn't have a book. They didn't have a device at their fingertips. They actually had to go into the synagogue and find a legitimate scroll and like scroll through it. It's a little bit more difficult for them than it is for us. What questions do you have? And number, and number three is as you pray through what you learned about what you want to change, listen to God and how he tells you to go and do it. Or you go, you know what, I need to get some advice from a more spiritual person in my life to walk me through how to go about doing this. It's as simple as that. Simple as that. Now, before we wrap up, I want to share with you two more verses that I have in mind before I open up the Word of God in my quiet times in the morning. The first one is Psalm 119, verse 18. And I would highly recommend that you put this in your arsenal before you have your quiet time in the morning. It just simply says this, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. God, open my eyes so that when I have this quiet time, when I dig into your word, that I'll see awesome stuff. You know, there are times where I read and I pray and I get into the word and I walk away from it and I go, oh, that's cool. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. It should never be. No, God, open my eyes. Let me see some awesome stuff here. Sometimes the awesome stuff doesn't feel so good. Because it's like, oh my gosh, I got to actually change this. Sometimes it's, whoa, this is blow away. And then finally, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10 says, The Lord came and stood there calling at, as, at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said this, and this is simply what you need to say. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Because it's fine for God to open my eyes and I see wonderful things. But if I don't actually listen to what he's trying to say, what's the point? 
My family, if you focus your mornings on having a quiet time, imitating Jesus, making it a priority, no matter what is going on in your day or in your heart, going after developing that intimate knowing of God, deepening your relationship with him, growing in your knowledge of who he is and he wants for your life and going after obeying it, taking time to self-evaluate before the mirror of the word of God every day, I can guarantee you that your life will be blessed in all that you do as the scripture says. And that, my brothers and sisters, is how you have an awesome quiet time. I love you all very, very much.